is up and the stock market's down and you're only getting mugged if you go downtown. I live back in the woods, you see, my woman and the kids and the dogs and me. I got a shotgun, a rifle, and a four-wheel drive, and a country boy can survive. Country folks can survive. Okay, folks, good morning. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, Christian's going to start our presentation here in just a minute. Um, first of all, thanks for coming out uh, this morning. Um, before you came here, we did have the room sanitized. So hold your sneezes. That was funny. Yeah, and everyone hold your breath for the next uh, 45 minutes or an hour. How many? All right, folks, uh, so you guys uh, know me. My name's Chris. You guys uh, grand design owners, right? Come on. Solitudes. Imagine. Awesome. Transcend. Momentum. All right, that's what Cindy and I, we have a momentum, the 395M out there with the honor flag coach. Um, before you guys leave here today, Cindy's going to be doing some uh, bike training, so she's riding her bike around. Um, oh, I, no, I didn't forget reflection. I have something special for reflection. So, um, Reflection. Wow, there's, there's a few of those out here. I did not, you know, in fact, I was driving around town on the moped, and I got lost because my battery was dead on the uh, GPS, so I followed a reflection here. So um, before you guys leave, I do have honor flag coins here. If anybody wants a coin, uh, please let me know. We're using that uh, for fundraising for the Honor Network. Uh, it helps us honor fallen police, fire, and military. So if you want to get a coin, they're special $15 for the rally. So, And we take uh, credit cards, uh, cash, and Apple Pay and v Venmo and um, PayPal and My MySpace. Huh? I'm kidding you. All right, Christian, this is all you. Um, here we're going to, I'm going to have you stand in these, uh, this area right here. And uh, if you could do the national anthem for us. Sure, absolutely. I can sing that, no problem. <laughs> oh, sing. Nah, I just can't. Uh, nobody wants to hear me sing. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, first thing I want to do is say thanks to Bob P. and, and Beth Page and all the volunteers uh, that made this rally happen. Uh, uh, what amazing thing they were able to pull off, uh, especially this time of year. Um, we're going to uh, start touching base on uh, a lot of you out here already probably know a lot about RV and RV maintenance. I'm not going to get into any, any um, earth shattering information, but I think it's some important stuff that, you know, it kind of needs to be reiter reiterated and, and what you need to know uh, as far as um, you know, RV and RV maintenance. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Christian Skursky. Uh, basically, I'm an FAA certified uh, aircraft and power plant mechanic with 26 years of aviation maintenance and high performance uh, propulsion system experience. Um, I'm an RVIA certified uh, technician, and I am a, GS1, a G G1 ASE certified mechanic, and basically all around Mr. Fix-It because uh, I'm too cheap uh, to call anyone, and I don't really trust anybody touching any of my stuff. So um, I, I'm, I, I take care of the, you know, the washing machine and the dishwasher and everything else, so uh, that's basically what, uh, who I am. Next. So um, one thing I got to get clear is I don't claim to be an RV expert. But I do bring, uh, based on my background, a unique perspective, and I like to teach and train. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why I, I, I volunteered to, to do this. Um, I want to ensure that everyone has the best and safest training information possible to, to freely travel these highways and byways and, and to keep your rig in tip-top shape. I mean, that, that's the important thing. We, we spend a lot of money on these uh, uh, rigs and, and on our RVs. So it's very important and critical that, you know, we take the time and to do the maintenance, the scheduled maintenance that we need to. Next. So uh, we're relatively new to RVs. Uh, we started RVing back in uh, 2017. Um, we've owned three travel trailers, and right now we're current owners of the 2020 Reflection 150 fifth wheel 2268BH. 
Um, that's what we currently own. And this is our first rally. We're having, as the, the badge says, we're newbies. Uh, my wife and I were here. Uh, this is a, a great experience. It's been a great experience meeting everyone and talking to everybody, uh, coming to the seminars. This has been awesome. Um, I, I think we, you know, definitely, definitely uh, well worth it. Next. Okay. So uh, some of the slides might be hard to, to see, um, but I want to talk about some statistics, right? So uh, statistics are very important to me and in my profession, what I do. But for everyone's general knowledge, running a piece of equipment to the point of failure could cost you, and it's all about money, right? This is all about money, uh, can cost you up to 10 times as much as a regular maintenance scheduled maintenance program. Uh, for every dollar worth of maintenance you decide to put off, you defer, you go, ah, you know, I'll get to it later. I, I'll, I'll change those tires next year. I'll take care of this, you know, a later date. Could cost you up to a, could quadruple to uh, up to four dollars in repair costs. Um, predictive maintenance. We use this a lot in the aviation industry because uh, when you're flying at 32,000 feet, going about 500 miles an hour, uh, a part failure is not acceptable, right? We we just can't accept that. And I kind of bring that philosophy into my RV maintenance. So driving down the highway at, at you know some of us at 70 miles an hour. Uh, a part, a component failure in your landing gear or, or running gear uh, is, is, is not acceptable, right? We, we can't accept that. So um, predictive maintenance is highly cost effective. It can save you roughly 8 to 12 percent over preventative maintenance and 40 percent over reactive maintenance. So th these are some of the key things you, you want to take into consideration. Um, and equipment eventually wears out over time, meaning that a very large portion of your mechanical failures are avoidable if you do the proper maintenance and inspections. Um, I know I see a lot online on social media about the, the China bombs and stuff like that, and it'd be real interesting because I'm, I'm a data-driven person to see how much is actually manufacturer defect and how much is actually un tires being underserviced, some type of damage that was done due to use. Um, it, it's very interesting to see, to see that data. Um, so, you know, th this is very important uh, information. Next. Okay, so one of the references I always go to is the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association 1192. Basically, this is the building codes for the plumbing, heating, fire, life and safety, and electrical of your RV. On the outside of that RV of yours, you're going to see that little sticker that says this RV was inspected and it complies with these standards. We don't have anyone, we have anyone from Canada. Anybody from Canada? No? Okay. So can, Canada has kind of something similar. It's a CSA Z240. The NFPA 1192 is a great reference book. Um, I, I always believe in educating yourself about uh, RV and RV maintenance. So if you, you can pick up a copy of one of, one of these books online uh, and read through it, and it kind of it kind of tells you and, and educates you in some of the requirements um, by code that are supposed to be done. If you bring your, your, your rig in for maintenance, uh, it kind of what the... Um, uh, you know, if they do service on it, kind of some of the standards that they're supposed to be held to. Next. So let's face it, right? Sometimes maintenance isn't that we, you know, we don't enjoy doing maintenance. You know, we want to get out there and get on the road and enjoy our rig and spend time with our families and friends and have a good time. Um, and maintenance, scheduled maintenance get, get, gets in the way, right? But the one thing I want you guys to take away from this is always follow the manufacturer. For us, it's the grand design uh, recommended service schedule for, for, for your rig, right? That's very important. Don't throw those books away. You want, you want to follow that, those, those recommended um, service bulletins. So when, when we, purchased our, uh, we purchased our grand design, we got that nice little uh, welcome packet, that little black envelope, and inside that is that owner's, ma owner's manual. This is your single most important resource uh, for finding out anything in, as far as your RV is concerned. If you, if you purchased new and, and the old owner, or purchased used, and the old owner got rid of it or threw this away, um, there's, they're, they're accessible online, I think, through the Grand Design website. So, um, but in here, it pretty much has all your scheduled maintenance and everything. So I, I re highly recommend that you read this from cover to cover uh, and get very familiar with your rig because there's, there's a lot of answers in here. Um, but there's also service manuals. Um, Owner's manuals, repair manuals, service bulletins, and installation instructions. Um, and, what I, and what I mean by that, when I went through the RVIA certification training, uh, we had to uh, purchase uh, a set of these uh, textbooks or, or uh, ma instruction manuals. And, and pretty much there's a set of about 14. They're pretty pricey. They, they go about almost 400 bucks. Um, but the great thing about it is anybody can buy them. 
um, and, and I'm not plugging for them or anything, but there's a lot of great information in there when, when you're, there's troubleshooting trees and troubleshooting charts that talk about if your propane system isn't working, if your fridge stops, some of the things to look for. Um, these, these, there's about 14 volumes, um, and they cover every aspect of your RV. Um, that, this is kind of some of the important you know, service manual things that you can pick up and, and, and learn. Okay, so remember what it, your RV is intended to be used for, right? So this is we got to take this into consideration. So your RV isn't a, is a vehicle designed as, a, as temporary living quarters for recreational camping, travel, and seasonal use. So all your inspection criteria is designed based, engineered based on those requirements. Now, if you, you, if you are using your rig for full-time travel and full-time living, uh, you're going to need to spe and, and step up those inspection uh, intervals. Uh, the reason I say that is because it, you know, there's a difference between severe duty and normal duty, right? So severe duty, if, if you do a lot of boondocking out in you know, Arizona or, or New Mexico and you're driving down a lot of those dirt and dusty roads, you're going to have to take more time to do more scheduled maintenance and inspections to make sure that you know, everything's up to tip-top shape. Okay, some more stats. Uh, I love stats. Um, uh, a lot of people don't. They find them boring. I hope, hope this is important information for you. But today, recreational vehicle industry has an annual economic impact of $20.1 billion in sales and services. It's a pretty big industry. Uh, there are 25 million Americans, that's us, who go RVing every year. Um, there are more RVs in use today uh, than at any other time. And I'm sure you probably noticed that recently. I, I recently read an article that talked about, uh, with the pandemic in place, um, sales of swimming pools, bicycles, RVs, and boats have, have gone up through the roof. So um, great time to be in it. However, because uh, people don't want to stop, right? People still want to travel. They want to get out there. They want to see the world. Um, and they don't want to stay in hotel rooms, and they don't want to get on airplanes. So they're, they're figuring, hey, look at this, in look at this uh, industry here. We can get in, and we can purchase an RV. So that means there's a lot of people out there, unlike yourselves, uh, who are purchasing these things who uh, don't know what they're getting into, right, who, who don't have a clue. So this is one of the reasons why I think these, these rallies are important, um, so people do. Uh, Two-thirds of current RV owners plan to purchase another RV. Grand Design does a great job. They did it to me, right? So <laughs> you, you, get the, you get the 2020 reflections, and all of a sudden the 2021 comes out, and they change the floor plan and change the colors and change this, and then it's like, oh, look at that. It's amazing. we got to get that one. So... Um, they plan on purchasing another one. So that's oh, it's there. Overall, uh, the RV ownership is only ex expected to grow. So you think if it was hard to get in the campgrounds this year, uh, I think um, I think that's where the where the where the where the uh, where the income's going to be owning campgrounds uh, coming in the future for especially for next year. So if you have any land that you can convert, uh, I recommend doing that. Uh, definitely. Thanks. Okay. Uh, major, major important thing I always like to cover and always like to talk about uh, is safety. Um, we get, we do, so safety. Um, we get out on these highways, right, safety driving, safety operating your rigs, safety is important. Uh, I can't stress it enough. We want to get out there and enjoy ourselves and have a good time, and God forbid something catastrophic happens. You, you just don't want that to occur. So safety is of the utmost importance. Make sure you have a safety plan for weather. Uh, you know, in, you know I, I was, at the, with the, was at the opening ceremony, and Bob talked about a lot of the, the things that happened at previous rallies. Um, so you always want to have a, a safety plan in place. And when you're working on your rig, uh, safety is important, whether you're jacking it up to change your tire, whether you're on the roof, safety is important. So please, please, please. Uh, safety is of the utmost paramount. Okay, RV uh, safety, you think we're only going to talk about RVs, or well, not. Grand Design doesn't make a class A, B, or C that I'm aware of. Uh, so we need to tow these rigs with our tow vehicle, right? So the, the safety of your RV starts with that, with your tow vehicle. You want to perform the recommended service, again, just like with your RV, Go into your glove box, pull out your little owner's manual, and make sure you're doing the proper service. When I, when I uh, cruise around the park here, there's a lot of expensive uh, 
trucks in, out there, and you want to make sure you're taking care of those vehicles. Um, you want to check your pressures your, on your tires, your torques, your, your, your tread, your born on dates for your tires, that's all important. Your fluids, your air filters, all those, your coolants. Nothing's worse than driving down the highway when it starts to rain and if cars are flying by at 90 miles an hour and you turn those windshield wipers on. We've all been there and you had that one piece of rubber that's just hanging back there and it's, it's not really cleaning it. So you want to inspect those. And if you don't, can't remember when the last time you changed your windshield wipers, um, unless you have a brand new truck, I, I recommend that you uh, change, change your windshield wipers. And then, of course, fluids, right? Your coolant, your oils, those type of fluids, your uh, transmission fluids. If anyone doesn't realize, you can actually have those fluids analyzed. Um, you can get them, you can buy kits, get order them online, uh, you can and send them off, and they'll send it back to you telling you specifically if, if, if it needs to be changed or if there's problems going on in your vehicle. So belts and hoses, wiper blades, we talked about that. Tow capacities. Tow capacity, no, uh, more ride was up here uh, earlier uh, yesterday, I think. It was. Uh, he's kind of seen. I watched it online, uh, and they talked all about that kind of stuff. I'm not going to get too deep into it, but tow capacities are important. You know, you don't want to exceed the truck's tow capacity. So yeah, we want the biggest rig and the fanciest rig. But if we're driving, and I've seen it, we're, we're, we're when we're pulling it with an F-150, uh, I, I think that there's a t even though if you have you have the you know I got airbags on it, you know you, you want to kind of reconsider. Uh, and your hitches and your chains, you know your fifth wheel hitches and all those stuff. Even though we use them over and over, they take a lot of abuse. So because of that, you want to you know inspect those things very good because they're out in the elements. There's corrosion. There are things that, that can happen to it that you just want to address and make sure you're, you're looking at. Okay, next. A little more, real quick. On your way out the door, just you want to check these things. You want to check in your engine compartment. Again, your oil levels, your fluid coolant levels. You want to check for leaks and around under the engine bay, debris lodged around the engine. You know, leaves and stuff get in there. Uh, your your belts, your battery in your engine compartment. Make sure that the terminals are clean and clear. Um, and then, especially for all of us who have uh, diesels, you know, diesels, you got to check your. You know, make sure you check your air filter. That's even in your other gas vehicles as well. But diesels, you want to check your air filters, your fuel water separators. Make sure you've done those. Your your fuel. Uh, your fuel filters, make sure they've been changed recently. And then, of course, you don't want to get that uh, driving down the highway and all of a sudden your def gets below where it needs to and your truck goes into limp mode. Uh, that's not always fun. So you want to make sure you, you got enough def on board. And don't uh, put the def in the gas tank. I've seen that happen and it's, it's always a nightmare trying to get that corrected. Get new injectors. I know there's going to be a brief on tires and, 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 and safety, so I'm not going to get too deep into this. Uh, I want to keep it short. But basically, you just want to check your tires, right? You want to check your cold pressure. You want to check your tire pressures when they're cold, right? You want to have your tire uh, pressure gauge. You want to check that. Uh, you want to make sure, uh, and again, when it's cold, not when, not when you've been running it. You want to check your uh, sidewall for cracks, tread depth, rim bead damage, valve stems, and you want to check it before every, you know, you check it before every trip, and you, and you want to check it um, at every stop. I Means for for a lot of experienced people, you're saying, like, well, why is he saying that? But there are a lot of people out there who think that they can just run and run and run and run and run on these tires, and and it's it's not it's not good. A uh, little quick, uh, you know, if anybody doesn't know about this, it's kind of like can you, how you tell if your tread's any good. It's the uh, penny quarter test. If you can see Lincoln's head or you can see all, all of George Washington's head, it's time to get new tires. I don't, you know, you want to check that tread depth and make sure it's good to go. Okay, lighting, lighting around the vehicle. Again, we're talking safety. Safety is a big portent, uh, portion of, of the importance, of the things that I like to bring to, to, the, to the seminar here. Um, but you want to check your lights, your headlights, your fog lights, your clear lights, your driving lights. You want to do the, your pre-flight, your post. I say pre I'm from aviation industry, again, I said. So I say pre-flights and post-flights. So before an airplane takes off, we do a pre-flight. When an airplane lands, we do a post-flight. So it means we look, we look around it, make sure it's good to go for it to take off again. So um, parking lights, turn signals, emergency flashers, your reflectors, and all your brake lights, make sure they're clean. You know, and again, it's, it's just something, you know, we, we say, hey, but, you know, this is obvious. This is just basic information, but it, I think it needs to be reiterated because there are times, and I th many of you have probably seen it, when you're driving down the road and you see someone else towing a camper or a truck or using a trailer of some sort and it's not properly uh, lit or, or operated. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the RV itself. We, we talked about the tow vehicle, very important, but now we're going to talk about RVs. So we're going to talk about RV systems, the electrical, propane, plumbing, HVAC, uh, hydraulic, nah, a little bit, um, landing gear, uh, I say landing gear, I'm sorry, uh, your running gear, uh, brake suspension, RV uh, appliances, water heater, refrigerator, range cooktops, your structures of your RV, your roofing and your slide-outs kind of stuff. Um, you know, we, I have generators and solar on there. 
Um, I'm not going to get into those too much, but basically understand that you know those also need regular scheduled maintenance. You want to make sure your solar panels are clean if you have them. If, if if you're one of those individuals that has solar panels and generators, if they're a lot of the bigger rigs have generators. That's I'm not going to. That's why I'm not going to get too deep into them. They do have them, um, but you want to do the serv proper service on those as well. Next. Okay, all good maintenance starts with a clean rig. So uh, I've seen it going on out here recently, people out there washing them and cleaning them, and you can see the, the individuals that take uh, great pride in, in what they have and own, and that's awesome to see. Uh, in the aviation industry, uh, just so you guys are aware, aircraft are wash, uh, um, washed before every major inspection, for, uh, and then they're also inspected for corrosion, so you can feel safe there. Uh, washing your rig a few times a year and a wax it at least once. You know, I, I, you know what, what, how many times should I wash? How many times should I wax? It's always one of those those questions. Uh, but you want to wash it a few times a year, and you want to wax it at least once, because it, it gets you up close and personal. Uh, and I know you can have someone come in and, 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 and do that work for you, or you can take it to one of those truck stops where they where they, where they they wash your rig. But it's important, um, the way I look at it is, is for you to get up close and personal with your rig. And one of the ways to do that is to get up there and, and wash it and rub your hands on it and kind of take a look up close and personal what's going on. Next. Okay, a good maintenance plan. So what does it consist of? So you should perform... Uh, inspections of your rig as often as possible, right? As much as you can. Um, you want to follow the manufacturers, I can't stress this enough, you want to follow the manufacturers recommended service intervals and inspections. Uh, you need to address any issues as soon as possible. We have a, a, a term as an aviation mechanic that says cracks don't get any smaller. So leaks inside your RV don't get any, they don't get any smaller. Right? So if you happen to see some type of water penetration, you want to try to find that penetration where it's at, and you want to address it as soon as possible because it's only going to get worse. Uh, you want to keep a logbook if you don't have one. A uh, logbook's always good to have. You kind of write down some of the things that you, you've done, you kind of maintenance some of the some of the products that you use on it. You want to have all that stuff in your logbook, so just if not anything, to, to jar your memory. Um, we, you know, oh, what did I do last year? You have that. Or when you go to sell it, it's always a great selling point where you can bring that information and to, to, to the next per person purchasing your RV. And you can say, hey, here, this is, you know, and it kind of ups the value on that, kind of gives it some uh, good. And, and you want to use your senses. You want to look, listen, smell, and feel. Look, listen, smell, and feel it. When, you, when you're inspecting your, and you're doing maintenance on your rig, you want to use those senses to kind of figure out what's going on. Again, I, I ran a test facility that ran high performance um, aircraft uh, propulsion engines, and I could tell from the test cab just by the sound uh, of the way the engine was running at certain RPMs if there was a problem. I didn't need the fancy computer gauges to tell me. Um, just from doing it for so long and, 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 and knowing the engines, you kind of get that sense. So when you all have that, you, when you're driving your truck and you kind of stop and you go, I don't, that doesn't sound right, or you're pulling your rig down the road, uh, it's all, you know, you, you have that. So use your senses. They're the most important for when you have a good inspection and maintenance program. Some of the tools you're going to need. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, you don't need much. Uh, flashlight, you know, a good flashlight uh, is important. An inspection mirror, because sometimes, you know, you have that, that leak under the sink. You can't quite see it. It's or that hot water here that's back in the corner behind a cabinet. Uh, so you, you get that mirror. You can put that mirror back there and check it. Uh, test receptors uh, or uh, receptacle testers, they're important. Um, when you're having problems with your RV and you're not sure what's working, you, know, you want to have one of these. These are pretty simple. They're easier than a multimeter. You can just walk in and plug them into your outlets. You can check your GFIs. These are a good thing to carry around and have, have on hand with you. Um, torque wrenches. Uh, you know, I know a Mo Ride talked about in, when they talked about their uh, running gear yesterday about the suspensions on the RV, and he said that everyone, you know, and everybody's yeah, we inspect, we inspect. But did everyone, does everyone go around and actually check the torques on their U-bolts, check the torques on their lugs? Uh, it's important the part of your inspection program you want to do that. Um, some ge general maintenance toolkit. You know, pretty much everybody has it, but again, it has to be said: hammers, pliers, that kind of thing, and specialized tools. So uh, when I go out and inspect RVs, one of the things I like to use uh, is a um, this is a uh, thermal imaging camera. So uh, whenever there's a guess, I, I, you know, if someone says, I, I think there's a leak, I turn on the thermal imaging camera and I can scan the walls. And when it comes up cold, blue, uh, that's, an, that's a sign that, hey, maybe there's some moisture penetration. 
in that area or there's not enough insulation in that area, depending on the ambient temperature outside, right? Uh, and then I go through with a, a moisture meter and then I can scan the wall and kind of see where the issues are. So these are these are additional things that you can you can pick up. You know, it's not not necessary. Um, but what I like to do is I like to be uh, I like to you know make sure that uh, I know what I, what I'm seeing. So again, the senses that that thermal imaging camera gives me that sense of hey, making sure it's I'm, I'm seeing with my my own eyes what's going on there. Next. So we're gonna talk about roofing. Uh, we start at the top. Let's start at the top of the RV, working our way down. First things first, if you are not comfortable with heights, don't get on the roof, right? Don't get up there. I talked about safety before. I'm going to say it again. Be safe. If you're not comfortable, uh, don't get up there. If you uh, are comfortable getting up there, just be cognizant of your surroundings. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's not much space to move around up there. So when you are, you want to be careful. You want to make sure you have your right shoes on, the roof's not wet, all that kind of stuff. You want to make sure you're good to go. Um, I think pretty much all the Grand Design roofs uh, are TPO roofs, which are thermoplastic polyethylene uh, type roofing. Uh, roofing warranties can be voided. Uh, and again, you, if you read that manual front to back and you, you kind of read the stuff on the roofing, uh, can be voided if proper maintenance is not performed. So you want to do the proper recommended maintenance. Uh, the alpha system roofs um, will need periodic maintenance. You're going to have to get up there. Uh, the roof should be cleaned at least three to four times a year. Uh, you want to make sure you're, you're I mean, I, I've seen people going around getting their rigs clean from uh, the, the pressure washer guy coming around cleaning. That's, that's great. I didn't see any roofs getting cleaned. Um, so you want to clean those roofs uh, often. You want to inspect the sealants each time you clean the roof. Uh, every time you're up there, you get down on your hands and knees, and you want to inspect that roof. Or if you're, you know, if you're, if you're uh, kind of apprehensive to get up there and you're hiring someone to do that, uh, you want to, you want to, you know, a licensed insured professional to get up there, and 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 you want to ask them those questions. Did you get up there and, and look around? Sealant should be removed and replaced. Don't try to, you know, to dump more sealant on top of old sealant. Uh, and you want to use the proper sealants. Um, for the alpha roofing systems. I know Dicor, uh, roofing caulk, sometimes that stuff, uh, it doesn't jive or, or, um, or um, a silicone. You, know, you don't want to use silicone. You want to use the proper roof caulks for the roof. And I think the roof is pretty much warranted for 10 to 12 years as long as you do the, the proper maintenance. So this is the uh, picture at the top of my, of my rig. You know, so some of the areas you want to pay attention to are the front seam, where the front seam meets the front cap. Uh, your trim rails along the side, around your vents, all the covers, you know, uh, your skylight, uh, and then the rear seam. You want to check that real well. Uh, quick story: some of my personal experiences. I like to bring my own. One of the one of the uh, trailer trailers I had, I was cleaning the roof. I was down on my hands and knees, and I was, you know, cleaning it really well. And I happened to notice a discoloration on on, on part of it, and I got real close. Got a flashlight, even though it was light out. Got real close, and I noticed it was a, a very small tear in. The, the membrane. So if I would have let that go over time, water was going to get into that tear, right? And and it was going, it would it would happen. So luckily, I was able to address that and address that right away. So these are little things that that, that just happen. Next, that a good maintenance program will avoid. Okay, your RV exteriors. Okay, we got basically three types. There are three types of RV exteriors. You have your stick and tin, which is like your transcends, right? The corrugated metal type siding. Uh, bonded laminate walls. This is what most of us have with imagines and reflections and solitudes. And then, uh, you know, Airstreams use a monocoque bonded wall. Uh, we won't talk about those. Um, but um, your walls, you want to look for delamination, discoloration, damage, and decals. You want to check the seals uh, very well around your doors, windows, and, and all the trim seals. Uh, one of the uh, things that happen here with, with fifth wheels is th those front trim seals have a habit of uh, weakening over time. So you want to inspect them really well because uh, what happened with this one, of course, is water got in there and it penetrated and it caused delamination. So you want to make sure that you want to check those really, really well, especially like when you're, again, when you're washing it, you want to inspect them often. Next. I know Grand Design does a, a, a very good job. I've never been, how, any, how many people have been to the Grand Design factory here? Cool. Yeah, that's my that's on my bucket list. I, I want to go there uh, and check it out. It's, I think it's pretty interesting. Um, but I know they they do a pretty good job of their bonded laminate walls in the, in there. Uh, they have a controlled uh, climate controlled environment where they where they do it. And I'm not going to get into the science of how they how they make the walls. Uh, but you know they do a pretty good job. I said, but the issue is going to be is if water does penetrate. I don't care how well of a process um, that you have, unless you you have Asdale, uh, which we don't. 
um, you're going to have water damage. It will eventually make that wall delaminate because it's just it's just the nature of the beast. The RV exterior, some more so slide out. So inspect your slide out gaskets and seals when you're on your roofs. Sometimes you know because the slide goes in and stuff, you kind of forget about the slide roof. Even if you have a topper on it, you might forget to kind of look underneath that topper. You want to inspect the roof. You want to inspect the slide outs. You want to clean and lubricate your mechanisms. You want to inspect your gaskets and clean and lubricate them. Um, make sure they're all good to go and buy the proper cleaning and lubricants. Uh, I didn't mention that on the roof, but don't use an oil-based cleaner. You want to use just a, 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 a like a spick and span kind of thing um, because. Because it could, it could uh, di uh, mess up the roof. Uh, same thing with cleaning of those. You want to make sure they're good to go. On the left there, on your, yeah, on your left, I mean, that's obviously a picture. They, there's the Dora Bond tape. There, obviously, something's going on with that slide out. Um, and then the problem is, is the fact that I'm telling you right now, there is water penetration there. So if you see an issue, you want to clean it, inspect it, and then take it all off, put it all new on, or get someone to do it. Make sure it's, it's good to go to keep your, your rig in, in, in good working order. Next. So again, for some of my experiences, um, on the left here is uh, my 2800BH. Uh, uh, one, I, so I came home uh, and I was doing a, a post-flight a post flight after we landed, uh, went around and, and was inspecting the RV. And I, on, on, the, on the trim seal on the side, there's a little plastic uh, cover that kind of covers the screws. I pulled it back just to inspect and happened to notice that up top there, you can see one of the screws are backing out. And so it's on the side where the um, awning extends. So as the awning extend, it put pressure on that, pulling that screw out. So the screw wasn't seated properly. Um, so that could have caused an issue later on down the road. So it seems minor now, but if you let these things go, um, it could become a bigger issue later on. How far was the next screw going to weaken? And next thing you know, is it, is it flapping in the breeze? So luckily, I was able to address that and get it taken care of. And even if you have a brand new uh, RV, the one thing I need to stress to everyone is that you still need to inspect it. You can't just buy it and say, hey, I'm good to go. Uh, you want to inspect all those things, especially to keep up with the one-year you know, uh, manufacturer warranty and all that kind of stuff. But um, on, on my slide out, on my Schwintech slide out, on my 2020 reflections, again, we came home from a, an RV trip. I put the slide out, we were inside cleaning up, and I happened to notice one of the screw heads was kind of crooked. So I walked up to it with my, my finger and I just poked at it and it popped out of the hole. Uh, and lo and behold, I, I, so I went and grabbed the screwdriver and I went around to check them all and there were seven uh, screws during man the manufacturing process that were, when they were installed were over torqued. Uh, so the screws were broken I, and, and the, the, the Swintech system, you know, with the making sure it's coming in and out evenly. I, I didn't want to move the RV. I got a hold of Grand Design. Luckily, Grand Design, again, they're awesome uh, with, their, with their warranty work and all that. And we're able to, I was able to get this addressed and, and get it covered by them. And it was awesome uh, and got it fixed. But these are some of the things, again, it was brand new. You, you, you want to keep an eye out on. And just when you think, hey, there's, you know, I got this brand new. It's going to be awesome for years to come. You want to do these inspections, right? Uh, Mo Ride went over some of the landing gear yesterday. For, for you know, I'm not going to uh, bore you as we're going back into it. But again, the simple stuff. You want to check your axle springs, shackles, equalizers, your tire born on dates. The tire born on dates. There's going to be another presentation I think tomorrow or Sunday uh, about tires and all. So I don't, I don't want to steal any of that thunder. Uh, but uh, five to seven years. You want you, you know. That's about the time to start changing the tires if you had your rig that long. Uh, you said use powder. Uh, what that means is, is if no one's familiar with it, you can basically, if you have a, t uh, you want to inspect your tires, uh, this is kind of like if you're buying a used rig too. If, if you want to check those tires and how you do that is you want to make sure there's no armor all or anything on the sidewall. What you do is you put the powder in your hand and you smear it on the side of the wall. And what that'll show is it'll show up dry, uh, like a dry rot or cracks or any imperfections in, in the side wall of the tire. Uh, it's just a little, one of the little tricks that they have out there. So, uh, and then, of course, your brakes and bearings. And Mo Ride talked about those yesterday. The running gear, again, they kind of touched on all this, but your brakes, you want to look for hanging wires, uh, your travel trailers or fifth wheels. I know Mo Ride again talked about your bearings uh, and all that. Make sure they're all good to go. And your brake controller check. Make sure your brake controller, you know, you use that and use that often. Uh, make, sure, make sure it's actually stopping the rig. Again, my experience, my 2800BH, uh, I've owned a few travel trailers, so I, I kind of uh, like to use my experiences because if, if, if I'm a user of them, I figure everyone else, there's a lot of other people, and I, I've kind of seen some issues on social media. But we were do, taking a trip down to uh, North Carolina coming home, and I noticed there was wear on the rear tire uh, on the inside uh, wear, that first top picture in the middle there. Uh, and I also noticed that the tire was impacting the underside of the wheel well. Uh, so I changed the tire before I, I went over to Chesapeake Bridge. I, I get home. 
I, I raised the, I, I measure, I start doing all the measurements to make sure nothing's out of alignment and it was all, everything was aligned. Um, I checked the springs, the axles, um, but the bow was kind of missing out of the, out of the, out of the axle. And it kind of made me a little nervous. Got a hold of Grand Design. Now, again, one of the reasons why we picked Grand Design is because for their awesome customer service, right? Uh, and they were, you know, we were able to determine that the axles that were used on the 2800 BH were the undersized axles. Uh, they were 3,500 pounds, but they were like a two and three eighths inch axle, the steel in the axle. So uh, Grand Design shipped me out new axles, new springs, new tires, everything. Hey. Uh, worked out for us. It was perfect. I was able to get all that changed, and we were good to go. Lucky for me, a lot of that stuff I can do uh, in my shop, but um, not. You take it out. You take it to your dealer, and they take care of it for you. So it's awesome. Okay, a little tip. Um, I know we were talking about bearings and kind of uh, and all the, and all the kind of looking at them, and I, I didn't see uh, Mo Ride talk about this yesterday. But when traveling and you're stopping for fuel. I like to use my uh, infrared uh, thermometer, uh, not only for the top of my uh, Blackstone grill, um, but uh, for also, you know, you're, you're driving, you, you drove a few hundred miles, you're stopping to get fuel, go out there and scan the hub. You take that thermometer and scan the hub of your tire, just scan the hub of your um, axles. And basically, your temperatures, unless you're in, you know, Arizona or New Mexico in the middle of the summer, you know, they should run at about an average temperature, 150, 160-ish, uh, out in, in the hubs, in the bearings area. Um, I know Mo Ride was talking about that when he puts his hand on it, he can uh, they, they can feel it. Um, if he can't hold your hand on, it's too hot. The nerves an issue. Uh, I use the gun, um, and basically, if but if you're going around, this is the one thing I you know, regardless of the temperature of of the actual hubs, if you're going around and you're scanning them, uh, and you have a difference of like 25 or 30 degrees in one of those. So all three, say all three of your tires or all six, depending on what kind of rig you got, uh, are reading at, say, 155 degrees. And you got one that's reading almost 200, 205, 210 degrees. Uh, there's most likely a highly good potential that there's a problem in that bearing, in that bearing area. Not enough grease or improper grease or something's going on. Okay, I recommend that you try to get that addressed as soon as possible, okay, because you don't kind of want this issue that's going on here uh, where it turns into a little uh, easy bake oven. Um, you want to get that stuff taken care of. It's important. Um, you want to keep going. When you get one bearing change, I recommend getting them all, and I recommend getting American-made bearings. Um, I have uh, We have a bearing company in my town, Bayview Bearing, that I always go to for any of my vehicles, for any of my trailers, for anything, and I purchase the bearing, bearings from them and know that they're a good source to source bearings. So uh, you want to make sure you get good bearings, okay? Uh, and impact them and grease them and use them and, and maintain them. And they'll last you for years and years and years. If, if, if they ever overheat at any point, you're done. Don't, don't, don't try to re... If there's any kind of discoloration on the bearing or any kind of scalling, get rid of them and get new ones, okay? Next. Okay, moving on to the uh, RV systems, electrical, propane, plumbing, appliances, uh, water heaters, refrigerators. Next. Uh, so your electrical, okay, just like the roof. If you are not comfortable messing with electrical, don't go walking around with a fork and sticking it in your outlets, okay? Don't do it. Some people are apprehensive. I don't blame them. Uh, I've been bitten quite a few times, so, so, so don't mess with it, okay? Uh, hire a licensed, insured professional to uh, take care of it. But if you are, your, your rig's been in storage. Uh, a lot of us put them in storage if we're not using them full time, but you want to check your batteries. Make sure your batteries are good. Um, if, you, if you take them out, put them on a trickle charger. Make sure they're charged because if you have, a flood you have a lead acid battery or a flooded battery, if it, if it discharges too far, the battery's no good. So you want to make sure you get one. You want to check the water level of your flood acid batteries. You want to check the seals, the tops of the batteries. Uh, if they're sealed, you just want to check your voltage discharge and make sure that's good to go with a multimeter or you can use, you can pick up one of these um, battery testers are pretty cheap. You can pick them up, you can attach them to your battery and this basically tells you if, they're, if the battery is good or not. Or not. Um, the thing about batteries is too is if you don't have that, you don't have to get that stuff, just take the battery to a Napa or an AutoZone or a Pet Boys or somewhere like that. They, they can... Uh, you know, make sure you watch them because I don't know if they're going to try to sell you a new battery. But you can take them to there, and, and they will they will test the batteries for you at free of charge, pretty much. Um, for your 120 volt systems, um, you know, it starts at your fuse box. Uh, we're not going to get too depth if you have a generator or or if you have solar. But the basic system, you have your fuse box. 
Uh, you want to check your fuse boxes. You want to check your fuses. There's two sides, right? There's a, the 12 volt and then the the uh, 120 volt AC side. So you want to check your fuses and your breakers and make sure they're good to go. Sometimes the breakers work loose and, and that can cause this problem. In an electrical system, resistance causes heat. Uh, I've seen pictures. Um, where people they, they show they take a picture of the their 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 plug at their at their uh, their electrical stand they pull the plug out and say oh it's melted like what, what's going on here well obviously there's something wrong right so it's causing heat which is causing res resistance which is causing the the plug to melt get rid of the plug get a new plug if there's any problem with your with your main plug to your RV to, to your pedestal get rid of the plug you don't you don't want to keep it get a new one. Um, you find any damage again on the cords or plugs replace them immediately don't try to repair them unless you have some uh, electrical you know de engineering degree or whatever but I, I would just get a new ones and then check your GFI outlets make sure they're working properly again uh, that's simple to do if you have one of these uh, little testers you plug it in you press the button the GFI pops you know it's working properly God forbid again safety you want to make sure everything is working the way it needs to be next for the propane season propane system that needs to be inspected as well, right? We, we kind of don't think about it because it's a closed system, but it's, it, it needs to be inspected. Um, kind of hard to read the, the, the verbiage up there. It's kind of small, but after, you, after your RV has been in rig, you're taking it out or you've been using it a while, you want to check the rubber hoses, right? The, the lines that, that are in there that, that go to your propane tanks. Uh, you want to look, because sometimes rodents and things get in there and kind of nibble away at those. You want to you keep an eye on that. Um, you want to look. Uh, you want to look for kinking in your copper lines underneath when you're underneath the rig. Where all you, you plug your propane grills and all that stuff in. Check those lines and make sure they're not kinked or broken. We're driving down the highway and roads. You don't know what comes up and hits them. You want to clean your water heater. Uh, get that clean. You know, if it has an anode rod, you pull that out. Get it all clean. Flush it out with your with your with your uh, with your wand to get it all flushed out and cleaned. If you just have the rig, the uh, Atwood type that are like the aluminum tanks, you, you don't you know they don't have the rod, but you, you still want to clean them out and inspect them. And one thing important is before. Before you turn that hot water heater back on, make sure you fill it up. Uh, you don't want to turn it on. It'll burn out those elements uh, uh, quick as could be if you don't take care of that. Um, you want to check your uh, all your vents, right? So all your vents. So down here, you, you talk about your propane cylinder. That's the start of your propane system. It, you know, most of us have those dot cylinders. The part, um, and and it, you, there's your uh, furnace, fridge, range, water heater, and generators for those who have generators uh, that work on propane. But they're the things that work on propane in your rig, and they're the things you want to keep an eye on. Uh, DOT cylinders, uh, pretty simple, but you know, again, it's not the regulator is not part of the cylinder, but that's where it starts. A good way to test is you buy that soapy solution, or you can make a soapy solution and pour it on on you know you can put it on that and see if there's any bubbling starts, especially at areas where there's connections. Uh, if there's bubbles, you have a leak. You want to get that you want to get that replaced. Again, safety. The valve itself, not much going on with the valve, but I've seen. You know, over time, uh, uses of the valves on top, the, the valve itself gets sealed or, or, or seized up and it doesn't operate properly. So you want to make sure your, your propane valves are good. And then you want to check that hydrostatic test date. But if, if you've got a new rig, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. Um, but pretty much at around the 12-year mark is where they recommend that it gets re-hydrostatic tested and inspected the tank itself to make sure it's good. So if, if you're buying new, uh, not that I've seen anybody do this, but, uh, you know, they can swap out the cylinders on you and, and you don't, you know, you didn't know. Um, so you want to check those dates on the cylinders. Um, that's important. So the propane system, again, we said that needs to be visually inspected. Um, smell. Uh, ethylene mercaptan. That's the propane is odorless. So they add a scent to it, just like they do with uh, natural gas to kind of make you go, oh, there's, there's something leaking. Right? So you, at the start of the season, uh, and I say at the start of the season, but anytime you mess with the propane system besides just replacing the tank, so if you break a line or replace your stove or, or replace the regulator, uh, it's highly recommended that you get a certified technician, licensed and insured, to do a pressure drop down test of your propane system. Right? You, they hook up the gauge, they apply pressure to it, and they watch to make sure it doesn't drop. This just will absolutely show that you do not have a leak. Uh, so I highly recommend that. And for safety, again, your batteries, right? Again, this is something simple, but sometimes we forget, right? Your fire, your fire alarm, your smoke detector, carbon monoxide detectors, those things. You want to make sure you change your batteries. And then your uh, propane detector also has an expiration date on it. Uh, so you want to check that and make sure your propane detector is uh, within, within if, the, if it's over the date, you want to get another one. Next, please. HVAC, not a big deal here. Um, but you, you know, your forced hot air, not much to inspect. You turn it on, it works great. Uh, doesn't turn on, doesn't work, uh-oh. Uh, but you want to make sure these vents are clean and clear of the mud daubers and the bugs and the insects. Um, so you want to make sure that's good to go. But not, not nothing crazy on, on the heater, except for just making sure you're, you're good to go and clean outside. Next. 
AC, your air conditioning. Uh, it might be hard to read those words, but basically they all say check the shroud. The shroud is exposed to a lot of abuse. Uh, so you want to look for cracks uh, and that kind of stuff on, on the shroud. Make sure it's good to go. Uh, there's no dry rot. When you, you know, pull the shroud off when you do your inspection and you want to inspect you know, your, your, uh, your cooling fins on your compressor and, and on your air conditioning unit up, up there, if the, if the fins are bent for some reason, they got bent, sometimes debris gets stuck in there, pine leaves, pine needles, leaves. You want to clean all that out of there because that's how the heat leaves. So people, you know, there's complaints, oh, you know, my, my AC is not working efficiently. I'm not getting the right cooling out of it. Well, sometimes it's just as simple as that. If the cooling fins are bent, you can straighten them back out with like a putty knife or a plastic knife very carefully. Uh, you don't want to damage them. Uh, but that's important. On the inside, when you go inside your rig, you want to, you know, again, those uh, your, your, your filter elements, you want to pull them out and you want to clean them as often as possible. As soon as you start to see a little bit of dust or dirt collecting on them, part of your maintenance program should be to clean them and get, get, get all those free and clear of all that dust and dirt particles because you want that air conditioning to work uh, as efficiently as possible to keep you nice and cool. Uh, next. And the other thing is get your fill, uh, flashlight and mirror and check up in there. Check up in, inside that. When you take those elements down, take a look up inside there and make sure... Uh, you know, there's nothing leaking. You don't see any signs of leak or, or burning wires or anything up inside that that air conditioning unit. For your plumbing, right? Winterize. People are going, yeah, no, no kidding. <laughs> I've seen it. Uh, so make sure you winterize. Uh, your rig. You want to sanitize and flush your system. You want to check your tanks and valves and hoses for your water system to make sure there are no leaks. This is a constant thing. Again, right, this is part of the maintenance program. You just don't want to do it once. You want to do it consistently and constantly uh, all, the, all the time. Next. Again, my experience, so 2020, reflections, we bought it, we parked it, I plugged it into a camp, we went to our campground, I turned on the water, I waited for about an hour, an hour and a half, and then basically what I did is, uh, we have the Nautilus P1, or probably like a lot of you do, um, and, I, and I, one, first I found a leak underneath the kitchen sink, uh, which I repaired, uh, and then I found uh, a leak behind the Nautilus P1 system, and I, so I pulled the panel off, and then I, I noticed, what I found was is the, the, the cheap PEX line that's kind of used, um, there was a manufacturer defect in it uh, that you can see that, that it was causing it not to seal correctly. I went ahead and I, I don't like those. I went ahead and changed them all over to brass, um, but uh, to make sure they don't never leak ever again. Uh, but you know there are issues. So even though it's brand new, or even though over time you know driving down the highway, bouncing down the road, things will happen. So you want to constantly. Uh, inspect so so now you know I, i'm always running around well, kind of getting my wife's nerves running around with a flashlight looking under here looking over here just to make sure things are all good to go because water will damage things very quickly next black water tank uh you know when you graze the tank uh, not that not that much you can do um but one of the things is you want to check those roof vents uh things can get in there debris can get caught which will not allow the gases to expose and you're kind of like what why is it smelling funky in here well if you go up top and you check that vent uh, make sure it's not damaged, and make sure it's good to go and clear. That's how that's how the gases get out of your get out of your black water tank. If you weren't aware, you know, as far as sensors, there's not, there's really not much you can do as far as maintenance, uh, except for you know you put your chemicals in there that, that you use and, and that kind of stuff. And the old uh, ice, you know, drop the ice down in the black water tank trick, and that kind of helps out. Next, refrigerators. So unlike your your home refrigerator. Um, you know, this is another. This doesn't re need a lot of maintenance, uh, but things that need to be looked at when people are saying, "Hey, my 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 refrigerator is not working right." So, for the first thing we need to understand is not like your residential style refrigerator. Uh, an RV refrigerator is what's called a continu unless you have a re uh, residential style refrigerator in your rig. Uh, but if you don't, uh, if you have the um, um, their continuous absorption type and uh, cooling units, right, that apply precise heat. So I kind of look at a, a RV refrigerator as a heating appliance, not as a cooling appliance, because it needs heat. So it needs that, that either the propane or the 120 volt AC, or if you have a three-way, you know, it uses the DC. Um, but it requires proper ventilation. That's why you have those vents on the back. Um, it needs to be level. It has to be level. Uh, there are no moving parts in your uh, RV refrigerator. And then uh, the cooling process takes longer, right, than as we're probably all aware. So you want to turn it on a couple days ahead of time. Um, you want to you want to let it give it because basically first it removes the humidity from the, the inside of the fridge, and then it starts to, its cooling process. So you, you want to keep that in mind. Next, these are the back. This is the mysterious back of of what goes on back there of your uh, RV refrigerator. But basically, uh, again, heat is applied to the boiler which then starts that chemical process. I'm not going to get into the science of refrigeration, but, uh, but in order for, that, uh, for the refrigerator to work, cool air needs to pass 
past the back of that air conditioning, I mean, back past that refrigerator. So what happens is, is sometimes there's, if you, if you pull the backs off and you see sometimes they, like they've installed this piece of plywood back there and all, well, that's there for a specific reason. And that's to make sure the, the, the air coming in the bottom, the cool air that's coming in the bottom and going through the top is, is, is actually going through your, your, the back side of that refrigerator. And you can see on the pictures over here, it kind of shows, uh, there's a lot of, with the slides, if, you're, if your RV has the uh, refrigerator on the slide, you have a vent on the side wall, top vent. Uh, but some of them have them on the top of the roof. So that, that cooling air comes in through the bottom, goes through the back of the refrigerator, and it goes out the top. And that's how it removes the heat from the, air, from the refrigerator. So if you're ever in those hot environments, and you're like, my, why is my air conditioner not cooling like it used to, or why is my refrigerator, sorry, not cooling like it used to. Well, sometimes it's just because that ambient air is so hot, you know, and it's not removing the, the heating as efficiently as it should. Okay, uh, everyone knows what these are, right? You know what these are for? Everybody see, you know what these are? Right, right. You know what it's for? Why it's there? Well, okay, so everybody's right, right? So yes, right? Uh, so one, it keeps the bugs out, but two, it serves another purpose. Um, if that wasn't on there, so if you're walking around your rig and you don't see that and you see that missing, hot air is going inside your, re um, your refrigerator. So what that does is by installing that, it's actually designed to keep a little bit of water at the tip of that, and it stops the hot air from going back in through your refrigerator. Now, if you ever lose that, like if you're doing, walking around your rig and you find it missing, not a big deal. Pull the plastic panel off of your R, you know, the back of your refrigerator, the bottom one, where that vent is, where that line is. Put a P trap, okay, twist, twist the line, zip tie it, put a little P trap type thing so the water will collect in it now and let it drain out again, and then until you can order a new one and get a new one. Um, but that, that's what that's designed for. Next. So some references. Um, GoRVing.com. Uh, I believe in uh, educating and self-educating yourself in regards to the RV, in the RV and the RV industry. That's kind of where I got where I was. Um, again, I didn't like people touching my stuff and working on my thing, so that's how I became RVIA certified, and that's how I started w w down the path that of, my, of, 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 of working on RVs and that kind of stuff. So uh, educate yourself. G uh, GoRVing.com has is great resources. I'm sure you have been there. The RVIA website, RVIA.org, another great uh, resource. NRVIA is the National Recreational Vehicle Inspectors Association. Uh, they also they, they're pretty good. They um they send out they have this uh, like home study course uh, that you can and I'm not endorsing them by any means. But if if you you know if you wanted to just educate yourself and get get some more knowledge, that's there. Um, RV safety uh, rvsafety.com uh, that's always a great resource. It talks about towing and all those little things, and, and pretty much everything on that website's free. RV education 101 um, they have little classes and courses that you can take. National Traffic Highway Safety Administration has a lot of great information on there. And uh, yes, there's YouTube. Uh, I'm, I'm, I do social media myself. Um, but uh, again, you just want to be kind of cautious and, and know the source of where that information is coming from when you're, when you're looking at YouTube, right? Next. Okay, guys, we went over a lot of stuff. Uh, I hope it was useful. I hope you, 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 know, you, you took a little bit something. I hope it wasn't uh, boring, your, boring your lights out with my stats and all that stuff. But um, I really appreciate you all for coming. This has been awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, just remember, a happy camper is a well-maintained camper. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thanks. Hey, real quick. Hey, before you leave, can everybody hear me? Hey, we just opened up registration for if there's anybody interested in the cornhole tournament that's going to be going on at Cherry 7 tomorrow. We're going to have four sets of boards. It's going to be blind draw. So where you registered, if you want to go over and sign up, it's $10 a person. Half goes to the winner, half goes to the fish house, and the second place team will get their money back. All right? Thanks. Thank you, folks, for coming out. Um, Check your schedule for the next uh, event. Those schedules are being updated with the locations and times. Check your schedule.
presentations today too? Yeah. Do you want me to? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. No, that's good.